A very warm welcome to all of you on this day when we would have started our conference in Milan. And it would have been great to see you all in person there and, and greet you personally. But I believe the next best thing is um, to have our broadcast on this very day. And even though we had to postpone the meeting, I'm really happy to share with you some exciting developments that demonstrate how active and alive the society still is in these challenging times. So first of all, I'm really excited about the start of activity of our nursing SIG. If you haven't learned about this yet, please go check on our website or on our social media. There is plenty of information about that uh, online. And coming to the meeting in Seville, I'm really happy that so far, most of our presenters agreed to come to Seville and present their work there. And the registration will go live on the 22nd of June. So just um, keep looking for that. And if you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to our newsletter. That's also a very valuable source of information about the society, about the ongoing processes. Now, coming to the scientific content of today's lecture, I suppose all of you know the Luoborndorf speakers from our live conferences, which are brought to you by the support of the Luoborndorf Foundation. And Lu himself, as an integral part of the development of healthcare simulation, the very innovative part of the community, was very much on board when we discussed with him our decision to bring this um, lecture online to make a Luoborndorf lecture series, which we start today with Professor Deborah Nestel. So probably you know Deborah from either from her position um, as first editor-in-chief of Advances in Simulation. Currently, she's the editor-in-chief of BMG Stel, the journal of the UK Simulation Society, SP, or from her research. Um, Deborah is professor for simulation education and healthcare at the Monash University and a professor of surgical education uh, at the University of Melbourne, both in Australia. And over the, her career, um, she has had ma held many positions in professional associations and she's leading many academic programs. Now, I will not steal your and her time by just going through her bio. Um, please go to our, um, to our newsletter. Um, the whole bio is there in detail. I just wanted to emphasize how perfectly qualified and how the, the perfect person Deborah is to speak on today's topic. And before I'm handing over to Lou, which will give you uh, some introductory words to the lecture series, I just would like to thank you all from the Executive Committee of SESAM for your extraordinary work and all the efforts and support in these times of global crisis. Thank you, and now over to Lou and then to Deborah. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Greetings, fellow SESAM members. As Mark has introduced me, I am Lou Obendorf. And we very much look forward to being together with you in Milan this week. Unfortunately, as we all understand, we are facing extraordinary times. I want to mention that you, the healthcare workers and members of SESA, have made extraordinary sacrifices and your professionalism and your diligence and your efforts at the front line of our defense against this global pandemic has revered you to us for all of your efforts. You are our new heroes. I wanna thank and congratulate the leadership of SESM, the executive committee, the science committee, and all the staff for making this important pivot using technology to keep our mission and our communication alive in SESM in absence of a physical meeting. They have been very innovative, very entrepreneurial, and as such, uh, we in the Obendorf Foundation uh, remain committed to the mission and role of SESA. This Obendorf Lecture Series is designed to give you and provide for you the challenges and opportunities that these interesting times present for us. 
the three speakers they have chosen for this Obendorf Lecture Series, will continue to challenge you, continue to offer you new opportunities to use our experiential technology and what we have developed over the last 25 years as a community in new ways to teach, new ways to communicate and challenge and educate. The mission and goals of SESM are alive and well, and we will stay with you and we will support you. Thank you very much. Be well. Thanks for the invitation to speak with you. I'm honored and humbled as the first in this new Lou Obendorf SESM online lecture series for SESM. I'm also really impressed by the adaptability and opportunity this series has created in response to the cancelled conference and just the, the willingness to provide a forum for what are some really critical reflections. So thank you again for this opportunity. Last November, I had the opportunity um, of delivering the John G. Wade Lecture at the Canadian Sim Summit in Winnipeg. There, I was asked to speak to the theme of the conference, which was diversity and inclusion in healthcare simulation. That experience of preparing my talk, of being at such a culturally significant place for Canada, of visiting the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, and of spending time with colleagues absolutely committed to deepening our understanding of how diversity and inclusion plays out in our healthcare simulation community uh, really led to me uh, critically reviewing my own practice. I realized then how much I still have to improve and I've made progress since then, only six months, but I still have much more to do. So this talk builds on that experience. Before continuing, I'm in a very chilly Melbourne, Australia evening, and I would like to acknowledge the Ruvaran people who are the traditional custodians of the, this land. And I'd also like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians, um, especially to Ronald Edwards Pepper, who is a Gunai Kurnai man who was studying art at the university campus that I worked at in rural Victoria about 10 years ago now. And Ronald did this painting and he also joined our simulated patient program. And I'm going to come back to that later. So I sit here in part privileged by my white and native English speaking heritage. And I recognize the advantage that these characteristics bestow on me in this contemporary world of healthcare simulation, one that has in, at least in contemporary history, been shaped by some very impressive white medical men. They've created a pathway an opportunity for what I and many others now do. As an Australian, I'm ashamed of decisions our democratically elected governments have taken relative to the treatment of our First Nations people, of the treatment of refugees, of the inequity of access to excellent uh, education for minority populations, and really of our silence um, on institutional abuse of vulnerable persons. And look, the list goes on, but I'll stop there. So I guess I've worked away in my bubble for years and the conflation of recent events has, I guess, burst that uh, for me. And I think enough is enough. I've called this lecture Superiority, Bias and Scholarship in Healthcare Simulation. Superiority, whether intended or not, bias, and I'm not referring to the statistical sense, but really cognitive biases. And uh, scholarship, um, I'm using Boyer's descriptions of scholarship relating to research and to educational practice. 
and looking at how the, these things play out in healthcare simulation. Uh, here are my disclosures. Each of them impacts on my talk. I'll just leave you to scan those. And a little more preamble. When I'm talking about diversity, I'm thinking about any characteristic that can be used to differentiate individuals and groups from one another. The notion of diversity and inclusion is about empowering people by respecting and appreciating what makes them different in terms of their age, their gender, ethnicity, race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, whatever the future might be. And while I'm speaking about diversity in these conventional ways, we also know that singular features are quite limiting. So I'd like to introduce, um, or at least make reference to the concept of intersectionality, because I know it will be familiar to a number of you. Intersectionality addresses the role of power in making meaning of the impact of these additive characteristics in influencing access, experience and opportunity. Intersectionality is already an established concept in health sciences and uh, you can see from the quote here from the Lancet and it's fast gaining traction in health professions education and I'm currently working with two graduate students who are both surgeons and um, we're exploring access and experience of surgical education training and practice um, but using an intersectional lens. I've divided the presentation into three parts. First, I'm going to speak about diversity and the implications for superiority and bias relative to our professional journals. Second, I'll speak about how this plays out in authorship and selected publications. And I'll pause for a quick Q&A then. And the third thing I'll do is switch gears a little bit and refer to my own simulation practices that have actively sought to address the issues that I'm raising. And then some more Q&A. So first, our healthcare simulation journals. There are currently four journals with a strong focus on healthcare simulation. These are the journals alphabetically, and each is associated with a professional society. So we have ASIM or Advances, which is associated with the European Simulation Society. We have BMJ Stell, which is associated with the UK-based Simulation Society. We have CSN, which is associated with an international nursing society, US-based. And we have Simulation in, in Healthcare, which I'll refer to as SIH, which is associated with yet another international society, which is US-based. And to get us started, um, absolutely fascinating paper by Leiden et al, published ahead of print um, with Simulation in Healthcare. And the authors write that serving on editorial boards is considered an indicator of academic productivity and success and a means of influencing discourse and practice in a field. I'd suggest then that editorial board membership is important. Here I've summarized the mission or vision statements of the journals and captured the stated relationship between the journal and their professional society. And I've used words from the respective websites and I'll leave you to scan those words, but we'll draw your attention to the underlined phrases. So for advances, about what they publish, all science and social science disciplines, all health and social care professions, and multi and interprofessional studies. From STEL, their audience is professionals in all areas of health and social care education, workforce development, and quality of care. With CSN, an international journal, and a mission to transform practice to improve patient safety through excellence in healthcare simulation. And it's really notable to me that there's no profession specific reference in any of their high level statements. 
And finally, from SIH, to serve a global community of practice enhancing the quality of healthcare and a multidisciplinary publication. And what I'm inviting you to do is to try to hold on to some of these ideas as I progress. I analyzed the named individuals on the editorial board pages of each journal. The editors in chief, two women and two men, all white and have English as their uh, first language. One clinician and scholar, the very fabulous Canada-based Nicole Harder, and three scholars are uh, from education, sociology, psychology, my very good friend, the usually London-based Gabe Reedy, and our colleague, uh, the US-based Mark Sherbeck. And while I know many of the board members and can confirm their gender, for those I didn't, I went to a publicly available information about them, including statements of preferred pronoun. CSN has a large majority of female board members at 88%, and I'm guessing this reflects gender composition of the professional population. So it simply remains noteworthy. We can see that staff fares well with slightly more women than men. And advances and SIH approximate 65, 70, 35, 30 split of men to women. Now table two. This one shows our professional background and I acknowledge that many board members have multiple roles and I've included just one. While this is a limitation of my analysis, I always find it a really powerful experience um, in faculty development courses, when people introduce themselves, often clinical background is the first thing that they raise. So I think it remains important. Uh, for my headings, I think medicine and nursing, midwifery are explanatory. Allied health includes physiotherapists, paramedics, pharmacists, and other SNEs, refers to human factors specialists, educationalists, um, psychologists, sociologists, and others. So you can see that um, CSN has a very dominant nursing presence at 78%. Um, nurses given their proportional dominance in the workforce are underrepresented in the other three journals. And advances and SIH have almost half the board members as medical. Stell looks to have the broader spread of professions and I guess at this point, I, I, I have to pause and just reflect that when the journal mission is interdisciplinary, interprofessional, or advance, advancing the whole of healthcare simulation, and there's a dominant presence of a profession, I'm sensitive to the implication of superiority or overpositioning that one profession may know better for all others. Third, I looked at the workplace of our board members and advances ticks all the boxes and interestingly has slightly more presence in North America than in Europe. Together with STAL, we probably have the widest base. In the last six months, because I did this exercise six months ago for the Canada meeting, um, CSN have really widened the geographic base of its board members and I congratulate Nicole for taking this action. Um, but the SIH board remains strikingly North American at 90%. Again, I pause. When the mission is global or international and the board members are largely North American, then I think we need to ask questions about diversity and inclusion, about superiority and bias. So in summary, for those three tables, it's really the additive effects of these features in the light of the described mission statements that the boards to me are feeling somewhat limited and exclusive. While I've not explored race or ethnicity, my cursory observation is that none of our journals come out well. Now for part two. 
Here we are. Going back to the um, Leiden et al. study that I shared this slide of earlier, you can see the title in which they focus on gender. They undertook their work in February last year, whereas my analyses were done in October and then again in June. And they've gone further in their analysis than me. They also consider authorship. They write. The number of first author peer-reviewed publications an individual holds has been suggested to be the strongest independent predictor of academic promotion. Well, that's fairly powerful. And from their analyses, they concluded, um, based on the review of just three journals, not CSN, but Advances, STAL, and SIH, that about 40% of articles had women first authors and 34% had women as senior authors, which in their um, reckoning was last author. And this is similar to the representation of women as authors in other domains of medicine, and it's considered to be indicative of a gender gap in authorship. I absolutely direct you to the article for a very thoughtful analysis and also credit uh, SIH for its publication. Now, slightly challenging their findings, and I think some time for some good news, I looked at the five most accessed articles in advances. So the five articles are with one, three, and five offering guidelines. Number one and number five have a very wide uh, reach, whereas number three is confined to nursing practice. The second article was a commissioned uh, study. And the fourth article there is a systematic review looking at observer roles in healthcare simulation. So again, with quite a broad professional reach. If I add to that the characteristics that I've been looking at um, in terms of uh, gender and lo location and um, profession, um, you can see the first article, there were nine authors, they were all female, eight of them were from North America and seven of them subject matter experts. Um, second article, one author female, Canada-based and an SME. Then the third article uh, from Cali, there were eight authors, seven of them female from Australia and all involved in nursing. And that's where their work was situated. And uh, the fourth article with the observer roles, and I declare um, a, being a co-author of that article, four authors, all female, all based in Australia, one nurse, one doctor, one allied health, and um, an SME. And the last article there, um, Chang et al, reporting guidelines for healthcare simulation. So this article has a really wide appeal. And um, you can see 14 authors are there, 13 of them male, 12 of them are North American, and 10 are medical. Um, I need to add that uh, the first and the fifth article also had uh, within their manuscripts um, acknowledgements of a whole host of other people who've contributed to the, the work. But I, I'm really just looking at the named authors here. So I shall move on. Oh, briefly, um, uh, shifting now to simulation technology and specifically flesh and body type, writing with my colleague Margaret Beerman uh, and explaining how and why worldviews and um, theoretical positions are important for simulationists to uh, consider. And for a critical theorist, um, who's, you can see from the quote here, who's oriented toward the social construction of reality, the color, body shape, and gender of the mannequin are really significant. And um, for an educator with this lens, a white muscular male mannequin, and they're certainly common, might perpetuate a notion that white muscular men are the most normal members of society. Pressing on. Uh, 
this article, again, um, published in uh, a head of print in simulation in healthcare. You can see the title there, Lack of Diversity in Simulation Technology. And you can also see a link at the top of the screen, which um, this article has been identified for the Simulation Podcast Journal Club for June. So uh, please uh, take a look if you're uh, interested. This paper really explores skin tone and other physical features of a wide range of simulators, looking at uh, catalogues and uh, doing an analysis. So it's, I think, the start of a really important uh, conversation, and I certainly congratulate the authors on bringing this work to the fore. It's so incredibly timely. Um, citing from their paper, as educators, we must be empowered to reinforce the value of diversity while also recognizing that our educational environments and tools may not accurately, accurately represent the wide range of patient diversity students are likely to see. That the absence of diversity can reinforce unhelpful elements of the hidden curriculum. And the authors even framed these as latent microaggressions. So, before we break for questions, I offer a caveat. My personal experience of editorial boards is that the names on a page don't necessarily reflect the energy and activity of the journal. While the associate editors at Stell have had a recent change in energized, the wider board is about to undergo substantive changes. The coronavirus pandemic has got in the way of me making more sweeping changes. It just didn't feel right to make the changes three months ago. And in seeking diversity and inclusion, it is way more than the optics of having a name on the page. It's being open to changing the structures and processes of journal work, of sponsoring, and of mentoring for reviewers, for editors, and it's really a whole board effort. So my commitment is that I can and will do better. So I would really um, like to break the questions. Thank you. Deborah, thank you for the start of, uh, of your presentation. That was fantastic, very interesting. Um, and I'm so pleased uh, to have you here with us to, to talk about it in, in some more detail. So uh, welcome and thanks for joining us this evening in Australia. Thank you. Um, so uh, just while we're waiting for some questions from our online audience, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the role that reviewers have in, um, in the online uh, and print publishing world, the academic publishing world. Um, the, um, the ways in which the role of the reviewer um, and often what happens with reviewers is they transition through to becoming members of editorial boards. Um, and I, I wonder if you just sort of ha have anything more to say about that aspect um, of the of the uh, of the of the work. Oh, thanks, Gabe, very much. And it's a really important point that you raise. I acknowledge it's quite a limitation of the the uh, lens that I've placed on the analysis. Uh, but I, I guess increasingly, I feel as though I'm in an echo chamber, and that um, I know. <laughs> Uh, over the last several months um, at BMD Style, there's been, we've really had difficulty get, getting reviewers and we've had a search in publications, so that's always interesting. And we're relying very heavily on our own networks and that's why I think we're probably, um, that we're often reaching out to the people that we already know, so we're reinforcing some of the biases that um, uh, are already there and it's really um, it goes back to the point about the optics of the um, editorial board you know it's all very well having people from um, uh, continents that are perhaps less visible in um, terms of publishing but unless we're actively engaging them in the conversations that we need to have 
to be true to the mission of the journal that we have. Now, um, if we're not seeking a global um, impact or you're, you've not stated that international reach, and I'm really interested that uh, at um, advances, there's not that statement. Um, and I, um, uh, I think that we've got to be really reflecting on the uh, what we're claiming to do versus the the resources that we have to achieve it i hope that helps and yeah, I also, um yeah sorry no no go, go ahead um i uh, i think that one of the the strategies to to really improve things is to and certainly at Stell, we've just started um a mentoring scheme and uh, we've had three people sign up and curiously they're all men um but uh when we we think that this is a really important strategy in uh reaching out to a wider community a community that perhaps we don't know so well and uh coaching them but we're not coaching them to be like us but coaching them to bring the richness and the standards of research that they also think are important absolutely developing them so that their voice becomes uh mature and able to contribute in a in a in a meaningful way um that that brings to mind for me um some of the arguments that have been happening and and again you you mentioned intersectionality um kimberly crenshaw um who is a legal scholar um came up with this notion of inter intersectionality in in her work as a as a legal academic actually and and uh, and i think it's fascinating that it's now starting to become more, um, uh, well, it's taken from one practice area into uh, another area uh, and field of practice, as you said, in health professions and in health professions education. Um, one of the conversations I frequently have is how, well, actually in health professions, it's a meritocracy. So uh, we're, we're talking about a colorblind environment or a diversity blind environment. Um, and um, and some of Crenshaw's work really challenges that and says actually this notion of a meritocracy that we think is uh, is pretty central may not be so meritocratic after all. Um, and I wonder if you have thoughts uh, uh, about that and the ways in which this this sort of notion that we think it's a it's a meritocracy um, limit our inclusion and limit uh, diverse voices. Um, look, I, I think that Crenshaw's work is fabulous and I know there's con, um, contentious issues associated with the appropriation of the term um, mm -hmm. from its original uh, use as well, so I, I do acknowledge that um, and I hope that it's not misappropriated. Um, and I... <sighs> I think it, there's just the, from my perspective, there's a desire for a um, it's the the additive impact, the layer upon layer upon layer of um, feet, a char personal characteristic that actually influences the um, the so-called merit as defined by whom for whom that uh, needs to be uh, challenged. You know, I, I had an experience uh, working with my uh, colleague Lars Kongi. Um, we were writing a um, Oh, a special edition celebrating uh, simulation for medical teacher. It was their 40th anniversary. And um, we, we had no trouble getting, um, um, so I'll be really direct here, male authors to accept invitations to write. And we um, encouraged them to have writing teams. And oh, if it were not for Lars and I in our individual manuscripts um, loading the women, um, then the proportions within the authorship would have been really um, distorted. And mm. so what I've learned from that um, experience is that you, when you're, you commission work, you have to um, be really clear about uh, requesting diversity and inclusion. You know, the mantle is no longer acceptable, so why should the all-male writing team also be um, 
acceptable. I think we need to challenge that. And our role is to open doors for other people, for people like myself. My role is to open doors for other people um, that um, actually think quite differently to, to me. Now, I appreciate with research teams, it actually takes quite a lot of time to bring people on and um, um, so I'm not looking for an instant fix, but I think that we need to be uh, considering that. Absolutely. I, I agree completely. And I wonder, um, how do we do that in a way that um, is both sort of appropriate and, de and develops those, uh, again, develops those voices and that participation in the kind of shared community, um, but that doesn't appear as, a, as if it's tokenistic? Um, and I, so I, I, I have gotten this question from colleagues before as well. I, I wonder what your thought is about that. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I know that it's not an, a single person um, effecting change. I'm looking certainly with publishing for our whole editorial board uh, to be working with me to try to make these uh, changes that we we develop cultures around us that um, are not about us but they're about putting other people forward because there goes your su your success in um, and I, I don't mean that in a um, kind of shiny way for me getting a um, an acknowledgement but it's that's the future and other people are going to be the future and I just have to um, try really hard to position that talent and that, that talent is going to be really diverse. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, one more question that's come through from the um, feed online. Um, just connecting this, Deborah, to what's happening in the broader society. And, and I know uh, this is a, a very important um, moment historically and uh, and that the, the um, uh, the, the, the impetus for this talk is partly in, in, in that context. Um, but uh, one of our um, viewers says the evidence for structural bias across society is pretty clear. Um, and and how, do we, how do we respond? So we've got some, some ideas in terms of uh, nurturing the community of practice in terms of scholarship and simulation. How, how else do we respond, uh, do you think? What are some of the other kind of key ways that we can respond? Um, so look, I, I, again, I don't know. I need to be guided. I need to be, um, you know, if I knew how, things would be different. And I suspect lots of other people would know how as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm open to listening. I, um, yeah, I just want to be uh, receptive to um, guidance from anyone who thinks that they know that they've got a better way of doing it because I'm not succeeding. I I want to do far better in, in this. So yeah. I need to reach into communities, those who are less visible, to try to give them a presence. And, again, it's not um, bringing them in to be like me. That's so not where I'm going. It's actually changing things so that um, they have a, a presence and um, I, um, I don't want to use the word power, but it is a sense of power to, to influence and change that we, we've got to go in a different direction. Absolutely. And I think it's by inviting those um, voices in and, uh, in and engaging and <clears throat> excuse me, having the participation of, of those different voices that we begin to shape the field and change the field, um, with, <clears throat> excuse me, which I think is important. Together. Yeah. Um, just a question from um, Mark. Uh, as there was a discussion of all the simulation journals, and this is our business, have you thought of a sort of ethical alliance of simulation journals to tackle this issue in common? Um, interesting question. Yeah. Um, so, well, hat gay. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, Nicole and I, have, Nicole Harder and I, have been talking about this issue since we met in uh, Canada, and uh, we don't have any uh, formal approach. But I can only imagine that uh, there would be. Um, some receptivity to it. And I know with SESAMS, our research community that they're developing, you know, what a perfect opportunity to um, privilege um, those who are less visible. I don't know how else to put it. 
Mm, absolutely. Um, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, um, I, you know, I think it is our job, as you said, and, and uh, one of the one of the things that I um, have taken uh, that's been most meaningful for me, actually, is watching, uh, especially on social media, um, our colleagues who are academics and uh, and who have voices in, in, in various ways, as things are emerging um, in the sort of broader context at the moment, just a reminder of Actually, I don't necessarily need to be the one that's speaking or deciding. What I need to be doing is listening, um, as you mentioned, listening to uh, voices from these other communities uh, and and uh, and drawing drawing those voices in um, and amplifying them, which I think is is important. Um, I uh, think at this point maybe we could move to the second part of your talk. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Now in part three, I want to share three examples from my own practice that sought to increase diversity and inclusion, remembering I'm thinking about diversity in a really broad way. The NETSIM program is an example of diversity and inclusion in faculty development. Funded by the Australian government, the target learners were from all health professions and mandated access for individuals living and working in rural and remote locations. The program comprises online and workshop activities, and there was a funding condition that 25% of the workshop activities had to be run in rural locations. Still with diversity, the program took a very four different simulation modalities, offering development in quite wide ranging simulation uh, modalities. Um, I've observed that many people um, who work mainly with mannequins or mainly with task traders or mainly with screen-based simulations or mainly with simulated patients are often disconnected from each other, um, but this program sought to connect us. So over 6,000 people have, uh, across Australia have completed the program and the proportions who've completed actually approximate the workforce um, population as well. So 20% medicine, 60% nursing, 6% midwifery and so on. Additionally, the participants came from different sectors of the health service, either private or public, and from a wide range of educational training institutions or in fact neither. And uh, delighted to report that 30% did in fact come from rural and remote locations. Uh, so we, and we offered the 25% of workshops in rural locations. So we um, met those government requirements. Moving on to distributed simulation or what I call DS. This is an example of diversity and inclusion relative to access to immersive simulations. While I worked in London at a very well-equipped surgical simulation suite, it became apparent that this was kind of extraordinary for surgical trainees who, and medical students who worked at um, the hospital who were on site. Um, but the cost of running the facilities um, precluded access for many. And if you weren't on site, then the effort involved in getting across London uh, for using the facility was often impractical. And we also didn't need a fully functioning operating theatre to teach many of the elements of surgical practice. So we worked with a diverse team of um, industrial designers, biomedical engineers, surgeons, nurses, anaesthetists, special effects artists, and indeed simulated participants to create a simulated operating theater and created an alternative approach to the static simulation center to achieve immersive simulation. So this is a self-contained set and it's an adaptable inflatable enclosure it's easily transportable um, so that access is widened. Um, it enables on-demand simulation training whenever and wherever it's needed. We believed that um, this approach was likely to engage new groups of participants, potential users, and uh, would probably also be more responsive to their needs because learning would take place where they worked. And it's also relatively inexpensive uh, to maintain compared with, compared with the oper replica operating theater. 
And here it is um, in an all-purpose learning space, um, pull-up banners of the anaesthetic machine and some other clinical artifacts um, all add to the flexibility of the setting. And this, of course, can be interchanged. In this final example, I examine diversity and inclusion by enabling ways for patients to have direct involvement in simulation. Because sometimes I think simulation drifts away from the very people it's intended to support, patients and carers. Much of my simulation practice involves SPs or simulated patients or participants. And I now hold a really strong position that in my practice, SPs are seen uh, to be seen as proxies for real patients. And while this may seem obvious, um, my observations and experiences suggest um, otherwise. There are often very strong power relationships between faculty and SPs. Faculty employ SPs. Faculty usually write scenarios. They run the training. They offer feedback on, for example, role portrayal. It's part of the job. That's the right thing to do. Um, but that power relationship of who is um, uh, determining who gets work, then um, can be compromising. And often simulated patients don't have, again, observed in practice and reported by SPs in some studies in which I've, I've participated, that SPs often ha don't have direct input um, to the work that they're doing, the roles that they're playing. My proposition is that real patients need to be connected with simulation practices at some points in the simulation-based education process. And not every time, that's absolutely impractical. But if we're to support learners in truly developing patient-centered care, then their voices need to be heard. Without a without real patient involvement, much SP-based work is a mirror for the teacher's preconceptions rather than as an authentic reflection of a patient encounter. And I'm not suggesting this is an intentional manipulative ploy on the part of faculty. I'm simply highlighting the challenge for those who are immersed in teaching and the delivery of healthcare to see through the eyes of someone who's not or someone who is the recipient of care. And the complexity of this challenge of seeing through the patient's eyes is evident in the many published accounts of doctors' experiences as patients and how utterly different being on the receiving end of care is to that of the professional provider. Here's just one example of many that I could share. Um, this is derived from my work with my colleague, Roger Nibone, and we developed this hybrid or, or what we call patient-focused um, simulations about 20 years ago now. And here is Ronald Edwards Pepper playing the role of the patient for the medical student who is now a doctor. The skin tone of the arm is okay, um, but it's much more uh, muscular than Ronald's very fine physique. As an inclusive practice, we interviewed real patients in the emergency department who are undergoing procedures that we wanted to teach about. Um, such commonplace procedures as urinary catheterization, IV therapy, antibiotic administration. And then we use the resulting information to populate our SP role templates. In one afternoon of interviews, we created eight new roles. And then we send a sample of these to our very experienced SPs, 22 of them in total. And we also sent them um, some examples of our um, faculty crafted roles and crafted by people who are very experienced in uh, writing them. And we ask the SPs to um, rate various elements of um, realism. And um, it was, it, became apparent that while the, um, 
the, well, the faculty roles were more complicated and the SP role, the um, real patient informed roles were richer, but actually often simpler than the ones crafted by faculty. But what it did for us was eliminate any sense of um, being a superior, having a superior knowing of speaking for patients. Um, it uh, provided an opportunity for patients' voices to be heard. Again, don't need to do this every time, but a very salutary process on occasion. So in closing, I've offered a light touch analysis of four editorial boards, and I think each board has work um, to do at minimum to align its vision with its board membership and to dispel any sense of superiority and bias. It doesn't feel right to me that some professions in one part of the world can position themselves as knowing better and best. So adjust the board, or change the mission. I shared uh, Leiden et al's um, findings on gender gap um, in authorship and um, some other publication illustrations of evidence of what's happening and why this is important. And then I've given three examples um, from my own practice widening access in faculty development for a rural workforce, increasing access to immersive simulation through DS, and engaging real patients in simulation rather than believing that we can always speak on their behalf. And I finish with offering uh, two challenges. I um, invite you to ask questions about diversity and inclusion of your professional healthcare simulation research community thinking about what doors can you open and I'm making a commitment um, for any commissioned work from Stell or from books that I'm involved in the editing process that will now request a statement of the efforts of the invited author um, of their efforts towards diversity and inclusion um, at minimum addressing our agenda but as I learn more about um, promoting equity, then um, that will be part of the invitation as well. And my second challenge is um, I hope that you will ask questions about diversity and inclusion in your own simulation practice, recognize them and make a plan for change. So thank you very much um, for letting me stand on my soapbox and um, I'm not sure what, what's happening with your bubble, but uh, mine's best and um, you'll be seeing some action from me. Thanks very much. Deborah, thank you. That was really, really fascinating and, and uh, challenging. Uh, I appreciated the challenge that you set for, for, uh, for us uh, there at the end. Um, a couple of questions that have just come up uh, through the through the second half of your presentation that I wanted to um, draw back to. Um, so uh, VTJ um, is asking about, um, again, you know, some of those structural issues that we talked about in the first, uh, in the first break um, and uh, posed a, an example of a potential positive action that we could be taking, which is that uh, mentees could be seeking out um, um, sorry, mentors could be seeking out mentees um, to draw in uh, diverse voices, um, which I think is is a is a fantastic idea and and, and sort of turns the mentor mentee relationship a bit on its head. Um, and I'm wondering um, if you've uh, got other sort of ideas or um, other things to add to the conversation, ways that we can act um, proactively and positively to draw things to draw to draw in these voices. Uh, no, I, and I think that's a terrific idea. So, no, I'm open to um, ideas. Anyone who has them, I can't see the chat, so um, yeah, no. please let us know how to manage this process. Uh, but I, I'm certainly um, uh, wanting to, yeah, to do something really positive. I guess if I um, 
um, to shift this a, a, a tiny bit to our simulation practice and really focusing on that second part of the conversation of what we can do in our simulation practices. And, you know, it's those, um, si oh, you know, we have research method silos, we have simulation modality silos um, that often, you know, the people working with SPs largely and not working with mannequin based teams you fit geographically located in different places within an institution that the, the more we can um, connect within our professional community and break down some of those barriers as well I think that that uh, would be really positive and I'm drawn to actually a colleague of yours uh, Gabe the the late Rosamond Snow and the extraordinary work that she did as a, an individual with a chronic illness um, she had diabetes which she was quite open about and I know that um, uh, she was quite inspiring for for me I've had um, wow. a number triggers for um, engaging real patients in my simulation practice. But it was really Rosamond who I think stumbled across some work at the sales centre uh, in London and um, credit to the sales staff who let Rosamond from, a pa from her patient perspective, living that condition, actually identify the learning objectives, um, her scratching her head saying, that's not what yeah. real would want you to know um, and you're giving her the, the the space to run whole mannequin based uh, simulations in well in fact she I know she was the voice of the mannequin but she only kept the mannequin when she didn't think a human could uh, step in so yeah. that that was really powerful work for me and to me it's an example of diversity absolutely absolutely right um Susan Eller writes in from California um, in my experience, we're better at incorporating simulated um, patient voices and reflection into formative experiences rather than summative. And she says, now that I write that down, it makes me reflect that that's another example of that superiority bias in play. Um, mm -hmm. So we're fine to allow sort of formative activity that incorporates those voices, um, but we have to maintain those knowledge structures in place. Uh, in, and, and, uh, and that's that superiority bias coming through. Beautiful example. Um, just looking through the, uh, the chat as well, um, Christopher writes, I wonder about governance structures that support inclusion, equity, and diversity of simulated patients, of community, and of our learners, um, bringing many minds and hearts and experiences to our oversight and engagement, as well as to the activity itself. Yeah, fabulous. Um, yeah. Um, I am... Um, I know a lot of the work that um, that we do, I, I have colleagues who, um, uh, when we're writing grants, they sort of say, oh, P PPI, sort of patient and public involvement. It's, it's just like, we're the ones who are researchers. We're the ones who are the scholars. We're the ones who are the, what we have the knowledge. Why are we, in, why are we drawing, drawing them in? They don't, they don't know how to do what we do. So how do we draw them in? Um, and I, I, uh, I wonder what your, what your thoughts are about how, how do we create the kind of opportunity? Linda talks about um, the need for PPI and, and, and uh, simulated patient involvement in simulation and scenario design. Um, and I think that's a, a great example of how we draw um, involvement in, especially uh, from, our, from our colleagues who are the patients, right? They're the, the, uh, the people who, who we're trying to support and, uh, and, and, and design care for. Sorry, you asking me a question? Um, just your thoughts or your comment on, on, oh, on that. Um, yeah. So, look, I, um, again, got referring to uh, some colleagues um, oh, that I worked with at, uh, in London, and her name is escaping me at the moment, uh, and I attended a workshop that um, she ran in Singapore uh, probably 18 months ago, and it was about... Um, you getting real patients at the table to help you form research questions mm. and um, not tokenistic acknowledge that it's really hard the language that we speak has to shift completely and it's um, 
And yeah, it's just or the lessons that I took and the lessons that I've had in um, with real patient. Well, some real patient involvement's actually been really easy to do, but some of it where there's been quite a, a cultural divide has been really very taxing, very um, demanding of time, thinking in utterly different ways and. That's exhausting, but that's also where the joy is. Um, so making time um, and that you, you're absolutely genuinely um, uh, interested in, in being inclusive. Um, there's a, a whole body of scholarship that is um, suggests really wonderful strategies that you can um, employ relative to public engagement in research, uh, shaping research questions. And I suspect that I should probably go back and look at those with respect to um, how they might uh, work for my educational practice and, yeah, especially for my educational practice. Mm, absolutely. Um, Colette writes in from London uh, about the ways in which we are um, sort of working now with some socially distant simulation and socially distant um, uh, governance and management as well um, may be uh, an opportunity to reduce some of the barriers and draw some voices in because often, uh, you know, getting those voices to the table um, doesn't happen very easily when people have uh, the need to be physically present in various places. Um, so our, our sort of, our, our bias towards face-to-face -to -face, uh, engagement now kind of drops off and there's the potential for us to, to draw people in, in that way. Um, and uh, a couple of people yeah, like, that, yeah. like that idea as well. Um, and I wonder about um, this idea of how, um, how we select for the people who are going to participate in the academic endeavors. Um, and again, going back to the question I raised earlier about our sort of idea of a meritocracy, um, Peter Diekman writes, um, perhaps we need to think about revising the criteria that we use to assess um, our uh, participation in, in various endeavors. So CVs, um, how, how people contribute to journals, how they're invited to join journal um, editorial boards um, and funders. Um, and and uh, a couple of people through the thread have mentioned ways we can incentivize uh, the, the um, potential for being inclusive. Um, and uh, yeah, so any thoughts on, on that? Um, it, none except it's fabulous that, um, yeah, the number of publications that you have ought not to be so important as who they're with and what doors you've opened. Absolutely. Okay, um, we uh, have just come up to uh, an hour together, Deborah, and I'm so grateful that you've been able to join us and uh, contribute for um, our community, both in Europe and around the world. We've got several people here from, uh, from outside of Europe uh, as well, so we're really pleased about that. Um, and uh, I just want to say thank you on behalf of CSAM. And uh, thank you as the founding editor of Advances in Simulation for some of the work that you uh, have, have done um, for our community more broadly. And, um, and also to remind everyone online that on the CSAM online channel um, next month on the 15th of July, we're looking forward to welp welcoming another voice um, into the conversation um, and that's Vicky LeBlanc, who's from University of Ottawa, who's going to be uh, talking to us next month. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, with that, we'll sign off for today. Thank you, Deborah.